Welcome to another episode of the Drew Aversa Show. I am so excited to have my guest today, Dr. Ina Park. Ina, welcome to the show. Thanks, Drew. Excited to be here. So excited. So you and I met on an airplane cruising over the Pacific Ocean on my birthday party a few years ago. That's right. And that was a couple girlfriends ago for you as well, I believe. Do you have to talk about that? I guess, <laughs> yes. Seriously, you have picked an amazing arena of medicine. And I just love talking about things that you're not supposed to talk about. You know, I yeah. mean, STDs are one of those things that like, yep. thank God I've never had one, seriously. But mm -hmm. it's like, it's that area of life. And if you have, like, there's no shame in it because it's, it's this area in life, right? We're told not to talk about and sex is just viewed in such a negative way in American lifestyle, or yep. it's highly glamorized, you know, depending on, on how you see it. So yep. you see like the nitty gritty with people and you're also an author. You are hilarious. And yeah, I just wanted to have you on the show to really talk about your journey from, you know, childhood into becoming a doctor into a field that I think there's just a lot of stigma and taboo around to, to break that. Absolutely. And then what you're doing with this book, because it's pretty cool. Sure. Well, I'm going to start with a little bit more about me. And so I'm, people can't see this because it's a podcast, but I'm a Korean American. Both my parents are Korean immigrants and they had an arranged marriage. And so they did not have sex until their wedding night or so I've been told and I believe them. And so growing up, with that kind of influence, the messages that I got around sex were, if you have sex before you know you get married, we're gonna kick you out of the house. Which just by the way, is not an effective sex education strategy in case you're wondering. So with that in mind, you know, I actually did start having sex before I got married in case people wanna know. And so it had to be hidden. There was no discussion about it. There was no discussion about contraception, STI prevention. So I was really operating on my own 17 year old kid in love for the first time. And, um, you know, luckily I did not catch an STI in that first relationship, but certainly, you know, through the other relationships I've had, I, you know, I know for a fact that I've caught HPV, which by the way, every single person, sexually active person catches, even if they don't realize it. And luckily I haven't, you know, to my knowledge, caught other STIs, but you know, if I had, I would have been completely ill prepared to deal with it. And so when I got, you know, fast forward a little bit into college, when I um, went, to, I went to UC Berkeley to Cal, and I was considering a career in research or a career in, you know, medicine, and I couldn't decide, but I ended up working with this peer education group, which involved me going out to frat houses, sorority houses, and other like, you know, uh, what do they call it? Dorms and um, and talking to student groups and doing you know condom demonstrations with a plastic penis and I had like a basket like a picnic basket like Little Red Riding Hood except I had my like dildo and condoms and and I would give that's away a job. Yeah, that's a well, that's a job in college. You know, wow. you don't get paid. It's you don't get paid. It's just for fun. But it was this opportunity to engage in a peer to peer way with other college students around sexual health. So it was a topic I never spoke about. I had to ramp up really quickly, but I realized how much people appreciated connecting with another person who was here to normalize having sex, normalize the fact that STIs happen. And, and then also just try to make a little, you know, make it lighthearted and it's not, doesn't have to be so serious. It's just, it's something that happens. We have to deal with it. But anyways, I did a lot of education and teaching. Um, one of the things I did, and there's a large sort of area at UC Berkeley where all the protests are called Sproul Hall. And on Valentine's Day, I dressed up as a huge condom. Um, you could only see my face. The rest of my body was sort of covered from head to toe. And I did a condom demonstration you know, for hundreds of people. And that was kind of a pivotal moment for me in my career because I started thinking like, you know, I'm really interested in breaking down these taboos and I really enjoyed doing this one-to-one -one counseling that I did actually as part of this job that I had in the student health center, as well as this getting up in front of people and talking about sex, you know, to a, to a larger crowd. And I said, you know, I think I'm going to probably go into medicine and try to do some teaching as well so that I can keep this thread kind of going through my career. So that's what I did. I ended up going to medical school at UCLA after that and sexual health has always been an interest of mine um, throughout my medical training. 
That is fascinating. And for young listeners out there, understand that there are a lot of jobs apparently out there that if you are creative enough, like <laughs> Dr. Park, you can definitely create your own career track. Right. And, you know, the thing is, it's, it's quite a journey coming from, you know, a, a family where my parents were virgins and arranged when they got married. And now I spend my life in between people's legs for a living and people pay me for that. It's amazing. I, I just, you know, when I met you on the airplane, I love you. Okay. I just have a lot of love for you because, you know, nowadays we're just in the society where you can't say this and you can't say that. And that's right. coming from the like top doc. And I mean, you are the top doc in this space in the U S you, you work for UCSF, an amazing uh, organization, top medical research Institute in the world. And this is the reality, everybody. We have to be real. We have to break these things down because sex has been around since our creation. And right. ever since whatever you believe, Adam and Eve, you, you know, the big bang theory, whatever theory you believe, no, no pun intended with the big bang theory, but mm -hmm. whatever you believe people have been having sex for years. So culture is something mm -hmm. I also like to talk about on the show because I've been around the world and I've seen different cultures. And in America, we are so polarized today. We're literally destroying each other through this polarized left, right thinking, all or mm -hmm. none thinking. And when it comes to these sort of things, you know, one, there's a beautiful thing of intimacy that we don't talk about, you know, because the Hollywood mm -hmm. novels, it's this, you know, sex and the big masculine guy and the woman and this and that. Right. But there's a beautiful thing of intimacy. And then there's also the reality that we are a biological species at the cellular mm -hmm. level. So yep. then there is this thing called disease. So mm -hmm. how do we create a more positive sex culture in America where we can talk about, you know, the beauty of sexual intimacy relationships, as well as getting help, you know, for disease and not making this such a stigmatized thing. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you sort of what I'm doing personally and what I see happening out there, which I think is positive. Um, one of the things that I'm doing personally is, you know, with my research and with this forthcoming book that I'm writing is just trying to engage as much with folks in the public as possible. Um, in particular, one group that you wouldn't think needs to talk about STIs is parents, right? Many of them are stably partnered and they're not at risk for STIs, but they actually need to start having these conversations about sex, STIs, contraception, pregnancy, you know, all of these things with kids actually from a pretty early age. And the earlier that you start with an age appropriate conversation, the less uncomfortable your kids are going to be about it. So I actually spend a lot of time talking one on one to parents about, you know, sort of how to have those conversations and the fact that you have to have many, many small conversations. And it's not just a talk, the talk, you know what I mean, that we hear about. Um, I think one thing that's happening that's positive out there is that the the growth of the internet and online content, I think in general, there's a lot of misinformation, but in general, it's nice that there are like really adolescent friendly websites like Scarletine, for example, um, that have, you know, scientifically accurate content that is non-stigmatizing, that's sex positive. So there is now like a lot of folks out there who are sex positive and who are putting their content online. So I think that that has been really helpful. So if a kid, for example, is confused about their sexual or gender identity, I feel like there's something out there for them online that will make them feel like, hey, there's actually other people out there like me. And there are, you know, actually places for folks to get accurate information and not if everyone around you is saying, you can't be that way, that's not normal, you're a freak, et cetera, et cetera. I feel like there are spaces online that are counteracting that narrative that I think um, you know, are helpful for kids coming up in the world today that I did not have and I bet you, you didn't have either when we were growing up in terms of normalizing you know, different you know, sort of sexual preferences, different gender um, identities, all of that stuff I think was not discussed nearly as much when we were growing up. No, I literally remember the talk. Like my talk was, I asked my dad, I was like, dad, what does fuck mean? And he's like, <laughs> like, I'm like he's like, uh, well, son, um, it can mean a very bad thing as far as like, you know, not good to say to somebody. And it can also mean sex. And then that led right. into the birds and the bees talk. And I was like, okay, okay, I got it. I got it. Like, oh, can right. we end this conversation? And then, you know, when I was 16 years old, I was riding along you know, with my stepdad at the fire department 
And, you know, I was around grown men and, you know, some yeah. of the guys were encouraging me to, you know, do things. And mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, your role models too, right? It's like your role view of who's around you, you know, what does it mean? And, and I just want to say to you, like kids listening is like, you know, the first time you do have sex with somebody, like, I hope it is special for you. And, sure. you know, I hope it's not a, a peer pressured thing, yep. like an activity, like gym class that you have to do, because it really is a bonding thing. I think through the years for me, I've learned, you know, those soul ties, right. Of like who you connect with on different things. Yeah. And, you know, it, it just, so take your time, you know, if you, if, and if you have kids, like, you know, just, just make sure that they have the right role models too around them and healthy conversations yeah. about sex. I think um, you brought up a couple of really important things. The one of them is something that we did not talk about as as kids, and I think you're actually a little younger than me. But uh, we didn't really talk about consent, and there was this assumption that, um, especially if you were a man, like you would always want to, you know, like if it's offered to you, of course you should do it, and um, and no one would need to ask you whether or not you actually wanted to. And so I think a lot of folks you know, would say that their first experience like wasn't exactly what they wanted, but they felt like they had to, you know, because the opportunity presented itself and they wouldn't be masculine if they didn't sort of take advantage of that. So I think, um, you know, that consent conversation is not just important for people who are raising girls, but also people who are raising boys or, you know, regardless of the kid's gender identity to have that conversation about about consent and what that looks like. Um, Yeah, and I think, Role model, you know, role modeling behavior is is tricky if you don't feel comfortable, you know, with what you're doing yourself. And so sometimes people have asked me, I don't really feel comfortable talking about this. You know, can my kid come and talk to you? And I say, you know what, bring it on. If there's somebody else or some other resource that you can point them to. Um, but if you give them a book, if you show them a website, say, if you have any questions, come talk to me, even if you know you're not going to know the answers. At least you can just say, okay, I know what you want to know. Let me go find that out. You know what I mean? And then come back and talk to you. Just leave the door open is what I'm saying is probably the most important thing. I love that. And I also love that you touched on men because, you know, a lot of my coaching, you know, is also with, with guys, you know, and business yep. leaders and whatnot. And, you know, when, when shit gets real, then we start talking about different things too. You know, one, one of the things too, as, as men in our society, you know, we're told, you know, not to cry, to toughen up, to do this, right. to do that. And you know, there are times I think, you know, through my healing journey that, you know, I, I did not want to be intimate, you know, and I was in yep. one relationship where some boundaries, you know, were a, a little bit pushed when I was healing. Yep. And I, I said, I, I don't, you know, I don't. And, you know, I was, you know, t- told some very negative things. Absolutely. And it was, uh, you know, a very abusive borderline, you know, and I don't, I don't mm-hmm. think a lot of men talk about that where, you know, I, th- I think in our society, it's like, well, yeah, you're supposed to want to have sex all the time. But I know for me, you know, on the healing journey, there were moments in time where I just needed to be, you know, because of what happened years ago, that, yep. you know, I wanted my body to be my body. And uh, I think that's just an important piece that you touched on that, you know, in our, our, our day and age, where, you know, in the Me Too movements and different things, I, I think not a lot of men share this. And I just want to yep. share this with the audience because uh, it, it, it's very important. It is. It's, it's so important. And, um, and I think especially men who've experienced, you know, sexual assault or abuse um, will feel like that, that, you know, that they don't always have ownership of their body. And then some people, you know, since we're also talking about STIs, that when that enters, when an infection enters the picture that people feel suddenly like violated or, you know, unclean or something like that. And I really am trying to undo that feeling as well of saying, this is just something that happens. The natural consequence of, you know, being a sexually active person is that sometimes we're going to get infected. It's the same thing with COVID, you know, sometimes just by going to the grocery store, walking around in the world, you might get an infection. It's, it's really the same thing. You just happen to, you know, have your clothes off for this one. Um, but I want people to look at it in the same way as it's just, it's just something that happens um, and not to feel like their self, their sense of self or their body, it feels like, a, you know, like violated because they, uh, you know, just happen to get unlucky and get an, infe- uh, an infection while they were having sex. So now we're going to lighten the mood just a minute. 
<laughs> and we're going to talk about your book. So when I was on the airplane yeah. with you and we were sipping those Alaska Airlines signature cocktails. Yeah. <laughs> Back, you know, back in the day. Back with, in the day. Yeah, back mm -hmm. in the day. What, what do they call that? The pog. The pog, I think, is what it's yeah. called on Alaska mm -hmm. Airlines. The, the nice juice and you're going to Hawaii and you're like, oh, like everything's yeah. going to be amazing for three, four days. Yes. So that trip, you told me you were writing a book with mm -hmm. some comedic, uh, you know, flavor of flav in, the, in that yeah. thing about STIs, STDs and sex. What, what's going on with the book? So yes, I think at that time I was, I think the book was still in its idea phase and not actually a real product walking around in the world. But yeah, I ended up getting a literary agent and selling the book and um, ended up finishing it. It will be out in February of 2021, which is very soon, just in time for Valentine's Day, your, S, your favorite STI book. Um, so congratulations. Yeah. So in the book, thank you. And my whole point of writing the book was to try to destigmatize these infections by using storytelling, by bringing in some elements of history and humor, and also, you know, interviewing really prominent folks in my field to just give people a sense of what's going on, you know, with different infections, where the where the research and the data are going, also. But it's all woven together with sort of history, humor, and storytelling, so that, you know, hopefully, it's a it's a light read. It's not a science textbook. And, you know, through that, through being entertained and hopefully enjoying and maybe laughing a little bit that uh, people will come out of that thinking like, you know, this is actually just interesting and not just icky, you know what I mean? So trying to shift, trying to shift the sentiment a little bit uh, and reduce the ick factor related to these infections. When was the first STD? What was it? I mean, it's hard to say, but the one that I think that's been written about, you know, historically for a really, really long time would be gonorrhea and syphilis are the two sort of oldest ones that are recognized. And then the newest sort of kids on the block would be like mycoplasma genitalium, which was discovered in the 80s. And then I'm not sure if you realize this, but both Ebola and Zika can be sexually transmitted as well. They can be in the semen for months and months um, after someone is infected. Good to know for those tropical. Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, in trips. case your yeah. travels, yes. <laughs> be, be careful, everyone. Now with COVID, I have to ask you, doctor: Are STDs going up or are they going down? What's going on in America right now? We talk about COVID. Every there's so much fear about COVID. I think let's right. lighten the mood and talk about something. That, eh, I mean, it's probably not great, but hey, let's just lighten the mood and talk about STDs in the minute. And right, are, exactly. Are Americans like doing it more or doing it less during COVID and getting STDs? Where, where are things headed? Well, so to answer the first part of your question first, in 2020, you know, not all the data are not all in yet, but uh, my prediction, if I had my crystal ball, is that STDs are going to look like they've gone down quite a bit. But there's a couple of reasons for that, Drew. And the first is, I think when we first went into shelter in, in place in many parts of the country in March, people were just, you know, scared out of their wits and they're like, I'm not going to go have sex with someone I don't know. So I think the people who were already stably partnered probably just kept having sex with that person. And then in terms of what we did see with the dating apps, for example, I'll take Tinder for an example. At the end of March, on March 29th, Tinder had 3 billion swipes in a day. And so people were going crazy meeting each other. But a lot of those interactions were, you know, like video chats and video dates and people were experimenting with trying to get to know each other, you know, either through Zoom or FaceTime or other sort of video platforms before actually meeting in person. So a lot of that was going on. But just to give you some anecdotes from what I'm seeing with my own patients, because I work in a sexual health clinic in San Francisco, is that, uh, you know, people can only hold out for so long. So one of my patients came in and he said, I, he's like, I tried five months. I didn't do it. And then he just broke down and he said, I got on an app and I just started, you know, meeting partners and hooking up. And then he came in, he had secondary syphilis, which is sort of a more advanced um, stage of the early part of the infection. And, and he was apologizing to me, like, I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. And I said, no, you know, listen, it's not about that. I know that people are going to have sex and it, I, I believe that it's, you know, starting up again. And, you know, the, in the balance between lust and caution, you can only be cautious for so long. But um, one of the things that happened, Drew, is that because all these like swabs and plastics and the liquids that we use to test for STDs also are used to test for COVID, 
there was like a national shortage of tests so that you, even if you had stuff going on, you couldn't go out and get a test necessarily. So, so that's going to artificially, you know, deflate our numbers. And, you know, I believe when the CDC releases their 2020 data, it's going to look like we don't have a problem anymore, but trust me, we do. Wow. That's some good stuff right there, Dr. Park. <laughs> and if you are at home listening and you are bored and you're thinking about experimenting, how can people keep themselves safe? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm going to tell you, there's all kinds of stuff online about, you know, should I wear a mask during sex? And should, you know, if let's say it's a male and a female, like should the male enter the female person from behind with a mask on? And there's all kinds of things that you can play with. Um, but I'm going to tell you there, because of such close contact required for sex, there isn't a hundred percent safe way to do it, you know? And so we just got to keep that in mind. So I'm thinking about reducing the harm that might come around from a COVID infection, which would be spacing out your partners. That would be number one. And so let's say you had sex with someone, you know, on Monday and Tuesday, you're like on Wednesday, I'm not into that person anymore. It would be best to wait, you know, for at least like seven to 10 days before starting sex with somebody new. And if you could get tested, you know, a week after having sex with the person, you know, just to make sure that you're negative, you can do that. So, and then of course, like the less people that you have contact with, the less likely, you know, to, you are to, to contract COVID, but spacing out partners and reducing the number is pretty much the best thing that you can do in Canada. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with glory holes, Drew, but um, you know, it involves like a, I a hole. I <laughs> have never, don't even know how they came up with the name glory hole that yeah. you need to talk about in your book. If you haven't the historical context of that, because it makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense to me either, but um, you know, it's something that was, you know, was around quite a bit in my understanding, like in the late sixties, early seventies. And I just don't, um, I mean, I'm not going into those spaces, you know, given that I'm a cisgender woman and don't have a penis, but like my understanding is that like the Canadian CDC, for example, put out guidance to say, hey, try a glory hole. And they actually put it in their official government recommendation, which I thought was incredible. And that's awesome because when you look at marketing or you look at advertising, yeah. right? And the government markets, they advertise all the time on different yeah, public absolutely. health campaigns. We don't think of it that way, but it's advertising right. marketing. And when you look at like Australia, some of the stuff that they, they do, European countries that yeah. are more sex positive. Yeah, and then it's the more US, fun. It's more yes. fun. It's like this country yeah. is all about fear. And, yeah. you know, I mean, we talk about separation of church and state, but we are not. Like you look at the lobbying done right. by religious groups and all that in the US, there's yeah. no separation of church and state. And then we have <laughs> this fear and we have all this stuff, you know, and, and I have my faith. I go to church, I, I you know, so yep. obviously people will say different things in the comments, whatever, like, I don't care about trolls. So the, the reality is we got to be real. Like we're talking about things that have been around for years and years and years. The right. other thing that I think you just hit on is the notion of safety, right? And where we put our resources. So literally people are getting COVID tests all the time. And before healthcare systems, they don't want to cover you for an HIV test. Like it's super expensive for a lot of people. So people maybe get that every six months or they get it a year and then they're sexually active and then the spread goes on and on and on instead of treating it just like a COVID test. No big deal. You want to get swab tested, boom, for free. What? Right. And some people feel so stigmatized that even though they might actually have risk for HIV, they don't even get tested at all. I mean, I think that's one thing that we didn't talk about. I think one thing that you mentioned about how pervasive sort of religious values or judgment might be into our American culture is I think a lot of people think that, gosh, if I had HIV or, or STIs, that's some sort of punishment, you know what I mean? Because I'm fornicating or something like that, you know, for lack of a better term. So I think that that hesitancy or fear and all the issues we have in this country with lack of access to healthcare and insurance that doesn't cover everything that you need it all comes together and it prevents people from going out there and getting the testing that they need. And you might be somebody who actually needs to test, you know, every three months because, you know, you have a lot of partners. If your insurance company only covers it once a year, guess what? You're not going to get those other three tests during the year that you really need. So that's why as well, you know, there are 
networks of different free public health, you know, sexual health clinics, you know, they used to call them STD clinics or whatever throughout the country where I, I get people who have insurance, but they say, I can only test once a year. So I'm, I'm here for my, you know, in, in between tests and that's totally fine. But I think it would be better sort of what you alluded to is if we had a more comprehensive health system like Australia or, or Canada or one of these other places with that comprehensively covered sexual health care, we would not be in our NHIV testing. We would not be in the boat that we're in. And how do we stack up compared to other countries? Are we higher than other countries? And I'm oh, talking yeah. about developed world, you know, developed countries yeah. right? because people always want to say, oh, that country's not this and that. But I'm talking about Canada, Australia, you know, countries in Europe that are at the top, you know, Sweden, Switzerland, those, those kind of places. How do we stack up compared to other countries when it comes to, you know, health and sexual health? Yeah, I don't know all the statistics for, you know, all the industrialized countries, but just using um, the Scandinavian countries as an example, we're terrible. <laughs> we're, we're, we're absolutely terrible. And, and um, when it comes to things like ex also, you know, for example, HPV vaccination, you know, there is a vaccine against one of the STIs, HPV you know, we don't have government coverage of that vaccine, for example. So it sort of catches catch can, um, you know, for folks who don't have insurance. And whereas in other countries, like I'll take Australia, for an example, they, they said the government's going to pay for the vaccine for every person, regardless of gender, you know, for that's age eligible. So it's just a different philosophy and approach to, you know, controlling um, STIs that, results in different outcomes. And I think as well, I think STIs are stigmatized everywhere. I just feel like the US is particularly, um, the, the stigma is particularly strong. You're, you're definitely on to the bigger picture, right? Of this conversation is about when we look at COVID and we see that we're number mm -hmm. one in COVID, right? And we say oh, America yeah. is the greatest country in the world. Like I'm like, yeah, right. we're the greatest country in the world for COVID and COVID deaths. Like <laughs> we're doing great. Like we're for really STIs, doing great. STIs, right? I mean, we're yeah, awesome. like, <laughs> STIs, like, people not having healthcare, unaffordable, right. affordable healthcare. Like, right. you know, we are the land of rhetoric. We are the land of let's cover up all this shit instead of fixing it and everything's mm -hmm. solvable. We have so much money when you look at probably in, in your field. I mean, how many millions to billions of dollars are spent on researching STIs? And then, and then we don't talk about the right messaging or the right things to have the right culture, you know? So it's, we spend all this money or even COVID, you know, at the start, we, we had literally elected officials in every other county, you know, going, oh, don't wear a mask, wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Like, right. You know, so, so why can't we have a better voice in America when it comes to health and better mindset, better ideology? What do you think it's going to take to evolve the American healthcare system to a system that truly promotes good health? Because for the first time we're seeing Americans are actually living less. We're spending a ton of money on right. health insurance. And then STIs mm -hmm. in, in your world are going up and, you know, right, maybe, maybe not during this anomaly year, but overall yep. they were going up. So how absolutely. do we, how do we change it? What do you see the future of, of healthcare is? I mean, well, if you want me to put on my liberal lefty hat, I would say, oh, we have to have single payer for all. Um, I, I don't see that unfortunately really happening. I mean, I'll tell you what I think has been happening that I think is a positive sign from a policy perspective. Um, but first, I just want to say that what you mentioned really resonated with me. We have a lot of tools, Drew, and we have great technology, and we have a lot of knowledge and a lot of smart people and a ton of research being done about how we should do things, but the application of our knowledge is poor. And I think part of that is you know, not having this political will of saying everybody deserves a basic level of healthcare and everyone deserves to be healthy. I mean, in our society, I feel like we look at it as people who are rich and privileged deserve to live a good life. And those who don't, you know, are, you know, deserve to live the way that they live. So I think, you know, part of it, I think, unfortunately, is part of American culture, but I'll tell you some positive policy things that I think have been happening in my field. Um, and I'm not sure if we can say the same about chronic disease, but there, you know, for the, for the first time, um, you know, pre-Trump, there was a national federal sort of HIV action plan for how to respond to the epidemic, which then 
brings stakeholders from all you know, walks of life. So it's like the substance abuse people and the maternal child health people and the STI people and the HIV people, they all get together and they say, and, and HHS says, this is what we as a country need to do moving forward. So it's what you mentioned before, Drew, it's like the unified message comes from the federal government saying, this is absolutely what we all need to do. And we all need to row the boat in the same direction. Not you know, oh, it, testing doesn't work. Oh yes, testing does work. You know, not this mixed messages that then nobody knows exactly what they should do. And the same thing just happened for the federal STI action plan, which I was actually involved with. HHS just put this out. The first ever plan got put out yesterday, um, was, was announced. And so, you know, that also is doing the same thing from a policy perspective saying, you know, HHS, the federal government saying, this is what we need to do. And one of the things it mentions is we need to destigmatize this and, and everyone needs access to sexual health services. So I think that those are the positive things that can be done is sort of making unified policy statements, leaders coming out and giving unified messaging. But you're right, Drew. I mean, when it came to COVID, we all know that it was a mess and that no one knew what was right and people were contradicting each other. And we cannot do that if we actually want people's health to advance. I'm talking about people as our general collective. We cannot have mixed messages. We need to be unified about what we need to do. I love it. And, you know, I think it, it goes to, in a, in a, you know, whether it's sexual health or whether it's wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, you know, it really is in that big picture of, are we a mentally sound and healthy nation, right? Because, you know, when, when people are conflicted to this level, I mean, how, how do you, whether it's talking to your child about sex or whether it's talking you know, about wearing a mask or workplace, you know, wellness, different things like that. Right. We're, we're so, we just fight each other so much in this country. And that's really my mm -hmm. hope that America gets back to a country where, you know, we really realize and recognize the gifts that we've been instilled with, with wealth, mm -hmm. with all these things that people, we can accelerate all these things. We don't need to live, you know, 70 years of advocating and fighting for things that we could literally, I mean, Elon Musk, can send a Tesla to outer space, why can't right. we fix the healthcare system? <laughs> right, exactly. It's true. It's true. I mean, we're making, we, we make it really hard, but you know, the thing is, is that I feel optimistic. We do have the tools and I, and I'm hopeful when things happen, you know, like when, when the government actually does get together and say, we've actually come to a consensus about what we need to do. It makes me feel hopeful that we do have some positive change coming and, you know, and we'll see, we have a new administration with different priorities and, you know, we're just going to have to see how it all goes. Dr. Ina Park, thank you so much from the first flight in Hawaii, where we <laughs> had that wonderful <laughs> drink. And, and for the listeners, I had one girlfriend at the time with her girlfriends and mutual friends. So it wasn't how it was teed up. Just want to have that for the record. <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience meeting you. It has been a wonderful experience having you in my network as a friend, as a colleague, as a thought leader in your space. And I'm so proud of you for your book being released. And what was the name of it? One more time for the listeners and how can they get your book? Where is it at? And how can they connect with you if they want to have you come speak at a conference or a school and do the things that you do so well? So my book is called Strange Bedfellows, Adventures in the Science, History, and Surprising Secrets of STDs. And um, it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all those uh, retail outlets. Um, my website is inapark.net. So I-N-A-P-A-R-K.net. And you can reach out to me there if you'd like to come and have me speak at your organization. And I would love to. Dr. Park in the house. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day and keep up the great work that you're doing every day, helping Americans live better, healthier lives, stigma free.